And our guest, Radley Balco, writes in The New York Times, Tyree Nichols' death proves yet again that elite police units are a disaster. Radley Balco is an investigative reporter, author of Rise of the Warrior Crop, the Militarization of America's Police Forces, um, and of the criminal justice newsletter, The Watch. Welcome back to Democracy Now!, Radley. Thanks for joining us from Nashville. Um, let's start off with uh, you, what you are saying, that these elite police units are a disaster. Respond to what happened to Tyree Nichols in um, Memphis and how this illustrates what's going on around the country. Yeah. <clears throat> so, what we saw in Memphis is, is a, a very familiar story, unfortunately. Um, what's happened probably for the last 40 to 50 years or so, going back to uh, the stress units in Detroit in the 1970s, is when crime goes up <clears throat> in a city, the police officials and civic leaders um, decide, you know, they need to show that they're doing something. And so they'll start one of these elite units. And, you know, it rests on this false assumption that the best way to fight crime uh, in a city, particularly as crime is rising, is to give less oversight to police, to sort of give police more uh, room, more leeway to kind of knock heads, uh, to, to supervise them less. And, you know, this isn't true, uh, but it is a way for these officials to kind of show that, you know, they're, they're doing something or they're taking crime seriously. And so we, what we saw in Memphis was uh, in, 2000, in 2021, when uh, crime went up in Memphis, as it has all over the country, uh, most likely due to the pandemic, uh, among other factors, uh, they start this unit called the Scorpion in order to to, uh, you know, again, to sort of demonstrate that they're really getting tough on crime. Um, the problem is, you know, not only is there no evidence or data showing that these units uh, effectively or even correlate with lower crime rates, um, they probably uh, inhibit uh, the ability to fight crime effectively because they undermine trust between the police and the communities that the police serve. Um, in order to fight crime effectively, you need to have cooperation uh, from the communities you're serving, particularly in high crime areas. Um, and you need people to call the police when something's wrong. You need them to, to talk to you when you're investigating a serious crime. And there are polls showing now that, uh, particularly in African-American communities, uh, people are more afraid of the police than they are of criminals. And that's just not a good way to, you know, to, to uh, promote public safety in these neighborhoods. Well, I wanted to ask you, in terms of that, uh, the uh, why are some of these units, or, or many of these units, then prone to be especially violent? Uh, uh, the, the Intercept, for instance, reported that, uh, uh, that the special uh, the street crimes unit and other special units like that in the New York City Police Department represented only 6% of the total officers but were involved in more than 30% of fatal shootings uh, so, so why do you see this tendency in these groups so i think what these units do is they concentrate some of the sort of more unfortunate or, or problematic parts of policing into one unit. So because there's less supervision and there's sort of a longer leash for police to kind of skirt the rules, they attract officers who want to work in that kind of environment. Um, and then those officers, in turn, recruit other officers who are going to, uh, you know, who, who share their sort of outlook on how policing ought to be done. I mean, when you call it a, a police unit something like Scorpion or Stress or um, uh, in um, uh, you know these, these sort of intimidating names. You know, not only do you that that name is designed to intimidate or instill fear in the communities that the police serve. It's also designed to attract officers who want to be feared. Uh, and so that's how I think we get some of these units staffed with officers who, um, you know, in, in Chicago, for example, uh, their street one of their street crimes units that uh, was disbanded finally in I believe 2011 after a huge scandal involving kidnapping, uh, drug dealing, you know, police officers beating people, planting evidence on people. Um, subsequent investigations found that I believe it was four officers on that unit had more than 50 uh, citizen complaints against them, which put them in the very top 1% of the entire department, and that's a department with over 10,000 officers. To have, you know, officers in the 1% of, of complaints uh, in the, that entire department in the same unit uh, tells you that that unit was, you know, designed to attract those kinds of officers. You know, we've heard so much in in recent years about uh, police reform. We've seen in many in in several cities, uh, reform-minded police chiefs come uh, to power. But why do you think the police departments of the nation of this nation are so resistant 
to uh, to systemic or or change. Uh, you talk about the barriers to that kind of change in a uh, in a state like Little Rock, Arkansas, which elected its first black mayor in 2018 and sought to uh, bring in a reformist police chief. Uh, what are some of the barriers that these cities find? So I think Little Rock is a good example of this problem. So in Little Rock in 2018, you had a mayor uh, who ran on a police reform platform uh, and won and became the first black mayor in Little Rock history. He then appoints a black police chief who uh, is a reform-oriented police chief. But, you know, that, that chief was barely in office, and the reforms he implemented to start were not particularly radical. In fact, they were, they were good governance-type reforms that other police departments across the country have had for decades. And there was immediate pushback from the police union and their supporters in the city, um, to the point where the chief was sort of harassed. There were rumors spread about him, uh, a lot of sort of racially loaded rumors about, you know, harassing white women. Um, they went into his finances. Um, and none of these, none of these allegations and accusations ever panned out. There's no evidence for, for any of them. But he was harassed to the point where he eventually resigned and left the office. And, and the city police department's now led by an officer who's in the department for 20 years, not an outside officer, more than 20 years, I think, and who has the full support of the police union. Um, so, you know, there are institutions in place. I mean, you, you, policing is something that has evolved uh, in this country since you know, 1920s, uh, even earlier in some cities, uh, there are institutions that have sprung up to keep things as the way they are, to sort of promote the status quo. And so it becomes very difficult uh, to overcome those those interests. Um, you know, we are seeing some reform across the country. Uh, we're seeing the election of uh, kind of reform-oriented um, uh, prosecutors, city council members, mayors, um, and particularly after the George Floyd protests, we have seen some really substantive changes on the state and local level. Um, you know, I think it's just a drop in the bucket uh, for what's actually needed. Uh, but I do think for the first time, and certainly since I've been covering this issue in about 20 years, um, we are, you know, seeing some movement in the direction of real substantive change. I wanted to go to the issue of conspiracy, Radley. Um, the Police officers, lawyers that are charged with murder are trying to separate each individual and saying, well, once they actually go to trial, you'll see he didn't exactly do this. And then you've got the one we have just learned, the white police officer who was suspended at the time that the others were fired and charged with murder, who you hear um, uh, saying in the first stop he tased or tried to tase Tyree, um, uh, you know, stomp his A. Um, mm -hmm. I don't want to say the whole thing there. Um, but the idea of these units working together, and that's the argument um, that the prosecutors are making, uh, that unless they're actually actively stopping the assault, whatever role they play, they're all working to uh, move in on, and in this case, beat and ultimately kill Tyree. Yeah, so, I mean, that's why I think after the George Floyd protest, you saw a lot of cities pass a duty to intervene law, which um, basically says that police officers see another officer violating someone's civil or constitutional rights, they have an obligation uh, to step in and try to stop that. Now, those laws are going to be really difficult to enforce, in part, again, because of the police unions. There is a, um, you know, there's the, the blue coat of silence is, is probably the most effective stop snitching campaign in, in U.S. history, right? It's really effective at getting police officers to stop uh, to stopping police officers from testifying against each other from turning each other in um, you know in, in a lot of these cases I mean I've written about n numerous cases over the years where you have you know a scandal like this where you have a police unit that was shown to have engaged in mass massive corruption and the only officer who's ever sort of held accountable is the one who turned the other officers in or who blew the whistle um, a good example is Adrian schoolcraft in, uh, in New York uh, the New York City Police Department a few years ago tried to blow the whistle on quotas that the arrest quotas that the department had and he was not only was he harassed he was eventually uh, they raided his house and they forcibly interned him at a psychi psychiatric ward because of course you know if you're reporting on your fellow officer's misconduct, you can only be yeah, apparently having some sort of mental health crisis, uh, according to the NYPD uh, officers who, who took that out. So I, I think there's a, a very strong sense of sort of um, camaraderie within pol policing today. I think police culture has a very us versus them mentality. Uh, and so it becomes very difficult to get, you know, even the, the, the good officers to report and hold the bad officers accountable because, you know, a lot of those Officers, if you do that, you're not going to remain in policing for very long. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, 
I've covered a lot of these uh, incidents of police killings over many decades, and I was surprised, I'm wondering if you are as well, about how quickly uh, these officers were not only fired, but charged uh, for this killing. Uh, it usually takes months, sometimes years or more, to get indictments of officers in, in police killings. And, of course, many people are wondering whether this had something to do with the fact that they were there were five black officers involved uh, in in this particular uh, in this particular death. Uh, also, the issue of the fact that uh, Tyree Nichols was a FedEx worker uh, in a city that the headquarters of FedEx, where more than thirty thousand people, it's the largest employer uh, in Memphis. And I'm wondering your thoughts about how quickly uh, there was movement by law enforcement in this case. Um, well, those are those are two very interesting theories um, that I actually hadn't considered. Um, you know, it was unusually fast uh, for one of these incidents, but I, I think there are two other factors uh, at play, or three other factors at play. Um, one is, you know, I think this is one of the substantive changes that I think we've seen since George Floyd, even going back to Ferguson, is we've seen the prosecutors are more willing to, to bring charges against police officers in the really egregious cases. Uh, Memphis also just elected a, a district attorney who ran heavily on a reform platform. Uh, so I think there was sort of political um, standing or political uh, support uh, for him to hold these officers accountable pretty much uh, immediately. Uh, but the other thing I think a player is that, that that video is just so incredibly harrowing and so incredibly horrifying. I mean, even, you know, people who routinely and reflexively defend law enforcement, people on the on the far right and the right, um, you know, even they aren't defending the police officers in this. Instead, they're, they've sort of pivoted to this argument that those officers were, you know, uh, affirmative action hires or that this was some sort of example of wokeism in police departments. But I think, you know, I think it's telling that they've turned to that. Um, they can't, n you know, no one can watch that video and, you know, not be just completely horrified at the utter lack of humanity shown by those officers, much less try to defend them. Uh, so I think both of the, all of those things played a big role in, in the quick, uh, you know, uh, application of accountability in this case as well. Well, we are going to, of course, continue to cover this case as well as others around the country. Uh, Tyree Nichols will be uh, buried tomorrow. The funeral is Wednesday in Memphis, Tennessee. Radley Balco, thanks so much for being with us. Investigative reporter, we'll link to your piece. Tyree Nichols' death proves yet again that elite police units are a disaster. Author of the book Rise of the Warrior Cop, the Militarization of America's Police Forces. Also, the editor of the criminal justice newsletter, The Watch.